Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I uh, am with OCTO, which is, stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. At OCTO, I'm coordinator of the EBM Tools Network and editor of the Skimmeron Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. And I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Um, today we have on Christine Taylor from the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, uh, as well as Mark Finkbeiner and um, Daniel Martin from NOAA uh, to talk to us about ocean re reports, a marinecadaster.gov application. Um, before I turn it over to Christine and crew, um, I just wanted to let everyone know sort of how the uh, webinar will run. We're gonna start off with a presentation and um, uh, some de live demonstration, I believe, of ocean reports, and then we'll turn to Q&A. Um, after the, the sort of formal presentation and demonstration. If you have any um, questions, you can you send them in through the question panel or the chat panel. Um, in the chat, you, it is, you are able to um, actually communicate with everyone in the audience. Um, so actually, if you do that, please use it respectfully and keep it to the subject matter. Um, and you, you're welcome to send in questions either way through the question or the chat. And we'll handle questions at the end. If you have any quick clarifying questions before that, um, uh, you can go ahead and, and we might be, have, be able to uh, ask the speakers during their, their presentation. But anyway, uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Christine. Thanks. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Christine Taylor and I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I am the BOEM lead on the Marine Cadaster Project. The Marine Cadaster Project and all of its tools is a collaborative project between BOEM and NOAA and contains data and maps from all the federal agencies and departments that deal in marine data or policy. I'm a physical scientist and geographer with 30 or more years of mapping marine data for the federal government. And I'm here to give you a quick overview of our newest tool that we call Ocean Reports, which you may find extremely useful for investigations and preliminary project planning. I think it's really exciting. I also want to acknowledge my primary co-conspirators that are listed on this slide, uh, David Stein and Mark Finkbeiner from NOAA's Office of Coastal Management and James Morris, Lisa Wycliffe, and Seth Therikoff from the um, National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science Beaufort Lab in North Carolina. And um, although there are many others that have provided considerable time and effort on this project that aren't listed here. So um, we have quite a big team on the line with me in case of questions that I get stumped on are Mark Finkbeiner. He's a physical scientist with over 20 years with NOAA's Office of Coastal Management in Charleston, South Carolina. Mark has extensive background in remote sensing and GIS and specializes in benthic mapping. We also have Daniel Martin, who is a geospatial data scientist and has been a contractor through CSS with NOAA OCM for many years. Both Mark and Daniel have both been part of the Marine Cadaster family for at least 10 years as long as I can remember anyway. So. so a little bit about this tool. We like to think of the tool as sort of the Zillow for finding information about ocean neighborhoods. So Zillow, you find the best house that you're looking for, best schools, that sort of thing. Here we're trying to find the best location or best information about an area of your interest. So you can get to the Marine Cadaster Ocean Reports using the URL seen at the bottom of the slide. It'll be on the next slide, so you don't have to write it down really quick. Um, so most of the data you find in the tool is also available on our marinecadaster.gov site. Um, so Marine Cadaster can help you find, understand, and make maps with marine geospatial data, but it doesn't do auto analysis for the most commonly asked questions of those data sets that we provide. This tool does that. Um, anyone can use this tool, it's open to the public, 
but we envisioned many of those listed on this slide, such as offshore project planners and stakeholders, press, educators, legislators, scientists, NEPA coordinators, anyone with an interest in ocean data. So you could use it to do things like determine the best probable location for a project based on the conditions you can investigate with this tool. And at the same time, find out what potential conflicts might hinder your plans. You could try to find the best results and then try again and again until you find the areas with the best conditions possible. It can be used for the first pass of determinations of available information for a NEPA review. Um, the results of an area report could be potentially included with a permit application or comments on a federal or state action. And you can provide the metadata and or download the data used in the analysis to whomever needs them. So it's difficult sometimes with a, a tool on a government website to figure out who's using it, how they're using it. And especially right now when we're not seeing anybody um, person to person, finding out how they're using things like we would at meetings or conferences. But we have gotten some feedback on that. So I've just listed a few of the um, comments that we've gotten from other users of the tool. We've been around for a little bit over a year, so we've had a little bit of time to collect some information. So for example, Andy Lanier from the Oregon's um, Coastal Zone Program mentioned that um, he can use the tool to evaluate coastal effects for their Jordan Cove Energy Project. Um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute said this will be this will become increasingly important since more and more marine spatial planning requests like ours will arise as economic activity in the ocean increases. And now you can hand some of the tools over to the user to answer the high level questions they might have. The Army Corps of Engineers said that they thought this tool would provide an awesome assist in various proposal reviews. And um, one of our collaborators on the project, James Morris from NCOS, held a NEPA webinar for NOAA and the feedback was that this tool could be fundamental and they'd love to explore how to adapt the resource into their environmental compliance program planning. So how do you get these reports? So ocean reports, um, you can get to a report two different ways. Um, when you first get into the tool, in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you'll see what our splash screen uh, currently looks like. And you have really only two options. One is you can draw a custom area and the other is to view a quick report. And the first one I'm gonna cover is viewing a quick report. Come on. I'm not used to doing this on my iPad. <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like when you go to quick reports. Uh, you basically get a list of the 120 existing areas that we've drawn. The idea here was that there are some areas that are going to be difficult for people to actually draw and areas that, you know, you might want to get more precise um, area for. So these are things like the state waters, um, or in the case of Florida here, multiple uh, sections of the state waters. Uh, you know, national marine sanctuaries or national estuarine research, research reserves or existing wind planning areas or lease areas. Um, and you can just, you, you can search on the left hand, start typing in something like Florida and it will bring up Florida Keys or State of Florida. Or you can just scroll through the 120 different quick reports um, you can see below the search. If you're already in a quick report and you want to do a different one, there's a little um, on the lower left Part of this screen a little clipboard and that'll bring you back to choosing your quick reports when and the other thing you can do in quick reports is you can see these blue areas sort of in the center left these are the last three quick reports that i ran so you can always get to your last three here so you don't have to try and redraw the exact same thing you drew before you can just go back And the next way is to just draw your own. So you actually have two options here. You can just draw right on the screen and you can make any kind of polygon that you want. It adapts, even if you cross over itself. Um, and then you can also enter in coordinates. So we have a little coordinate tool down where that arrow is. And you can actually um, copy and paste or just type in 
uh, decimal degrees, geographic coordinates, and the one clue is to make sure that your first and last coordinate match so that the polygon can end on it or the line can end on itself and create a polygon. So once you've done this, you're going to get results in literally seconds and not 20 seconds, but two seconds or less usually. So there, it's going to actually do the analysis on all of our data all at one time. And you can just keep doing this again and again until you get the area or results that you're looking for. So within Ocean Reports, we have six topic areas or chapters, which all run at the same time, like I said, resulting in 68 separate infographic results. And, um, excuse me, we have general information in the red, and that's basically giving you just sort of the basic information about the area that you drew. So it'll give you the area and different units for your report, depth and elevation, the populated places, the federal, state, or county jurisdictions, um, congressional legislative districts, federal statutes, and tribal land. So this is one of our smaller um, lists here. The next is energy and minerals, and this will give you information about wind potential and current wind actions that are going on. Um, then oil and gas areas and oil and gas leases and um, beach renourishment, sand leases, that sort of thing. Then we also have transportation and infrastructure. So this includes things like um, vessel traffic, AIS, uh, ports, all the stuff that's uh, attached to the seafloor, such as cables and platforms and wells, unexploded ordinances, um, danger zones, that sort of thing. Then we have natural resources, and this includes Things like endangered species, highly migratory species, bird areas, protected areas, shallow corals, cetacean biologically important areas to name a few. Um, we have oceanographic and biophysical information. So these are things like wave height, wind speed, current speed, salinity and temperature, nutrients, harmful algal blooms, clarity. And then economics and commerce, which includes um, three different infographics that come out of the NOAA ENAL data, which are jobs, ocean economy, GDP, and contribution by sectors. Then we have um, census statistics and commercial fish landings. Okay, before I go into um, each of those chapters a little more detail, uh, what I wanted to do was just describe what you might find in an infographic so that when you actually look at the tool, you don't misinterpret what you're looking at. And it's really important to know all the different components and where to look for things. So the first part that you'll see is that we will have for each infographic a title, and that's usually at the top left. And usually we have a description. My example here does not have a description, but most of the time we have a description telling you what it is and why it's there. And then you'll have on the right of the title an add to layer button. So that's like three little squares on top of each other. And if you click on that, you can add the underlying geospatial layers to the map, which will appear on the right of your infographics. And then we have um, a little I button or information button. That could have almost anything in it, but it's meant to have extra information that you don't need to crowd your report with. But it usually has a legend in it. It has citation information in some cases, has caveats that we want you to be aware of, maybe the calculations that we use to get the information on the infographic. Um, it could be almost anything, a lot of links, for instance. So then the body of the infographic, you have either graphics or lists or histograms or tables, that sort of thing. In this case, it's pretty simple. We've got um, the congressional number of congressional districts and number of state districts. And then below that is you have the ability to hit the little plus sign to get more information about which congressional districts or state senator, state house um, districts there are in your area of interest. And you could then find out through the information button in this particular case, there's links to the member directories, so you can let them know what a wonderful their job that they're doing in your area. Um, we also have the most important part of this besides the graphics is what I um, like to call the rule. And so the rules are the what, how, and why you get the results in the box. So 
Each infographic is run based on different geospatial rules, depending on the subject matter experts for each layer's thoughts on what those rules should be. Um, rules or statements such as showing the federal statutes that apply inside the report area, or showing the min, max, and mean of vessel counts by type inside the report area. Showing all ports that overlap the area and the closest three or only closest three if not overlap the area. So you can kind of see why it's important to understand what the results are and why you're getting those results for that particular infographic and every one of them is a little bit different. So here's an example of some of the results for the general tab, which has seven infographics in total listed in red above. Um, because I'm doing this as a PowerPoint, I can't really scroll through this, but um, if I have time, I'll, I'll show you the app a little bit if I can. Um, these are only two of the seven infographics under general information. Um, the screen capture for a portion of general information showing the federal statutes and congressional legislative districts. In this case, it's showing all the districts within 12 nautical miles of the report area or the closest three if none are within 12 nautical miles. So that's your rule for that one. And if you look, you'll see all the federal statutes are actually links, which will persist within any PDF you might create from the report. So then I'm showing your en energy and minerals, and you can see all the infographics in the gray at the top. There's 13 of them. Um, I've included a few examples for this section, just to give you a sort of a better overview. The first is our offshore wind resource potential. It's actually um, doing a calculation in there that will give you the estimate based on the DOE energy um, calculation estimate, which is in under the I button. Um, but it's estimating how many houses could be powered if you were to build out that huge polygon completely with wind turbines, um, which we would never do for something that size. But that's why you're getting a number like 30 million houses in that area. So, uh, let's see. The next is the BOEM offshore oil and gas resources. So these are the oil and gas resources in federal waters, something we call plays, which are um, basically consistent hydrocarbon geologic pools that are usually there's more than one stacked on top of each other. So it's showing you in this case how many plays it's found that intersect that polygon. And then there's actually more than what we're showing, um, but it shortens the list. So then you can hit the show all 34 plays or 24 plays um, if you like. But each one is telling you what uh, Bohm's estimate for the resource is for each of those plays. And then finally, I have included surficial sediment texture showing the type of counts in the histogram and ocean disposal sites are on there as well, showing the types and counts in the table. I've elected also to add a couple layers. I've, I'm um, showing the bomb sand resource areas in orange and the oil and gas leases in beige on there. And you can see the histogram under superficial sediment texture is showing um, that there's quite a lot of mud in your area of interest compared to the other types of uh, sediments that have points. So those are all the little mauve sort of colored points in there. Then we have natural resources chapter. It contains 13 separate in infographics and links to other tools provided by NOAA and the US Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the first thing you'll see is information about where you can click to get more information about endangered species in the area. And, um, these are coming from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and NOAA rather than reinvent what they've already provided. We just send you to those tools. And one of them is the Information for Planning and Consultation tool or IPAC. And if you were to click on that and actually run through the tool, you can do a similar drawing like you can in Ocean Reports. And this is not what you see on our page, but sort of my result after drawing a similar polygon in the same area. And it'll give you the list of the threatened and endangered uh, animals, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. Okay. So I'm also showing the uh, closest Audubon important bird areas here. And I've put the, and also artificial reefs. It's just giving you how many artificial reefs are in the area. 
and protected areas on the left screen. And I've turned all of those on the map along with deep sea coral and sponges observations and deep sea coral habitat suitability layers. So just to give you an idea that you can turn on really any layers that are in the tool, it doesn't matter which chapter you're in or which infographic you're in. So our transportation um, and infrastructure chapter has the most infographics, 18. And here I'm showing the vessel count table followed by vessel routing measures. Um, and I've added the fishing vessel tracks to the map along with the routing measure and oil and gas platforms. And I've also turned on the nautical chart based map. So if you were to hit that I button for the vessel tracks, you would get all the legends for each of the vessel track types, which if I were to scroll down, you'd see, I think, seven or eight different legends here. And then a link to the US Coast Guard. So if you want to understand more about the AIS, you can do that. Our oceanographic and biophysical chapter has 13 infographics. These uh, layers were put together primarily through our National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science partners, and they've done a wonderful job creating some incredible maps and graphics uh, for these layers. So right now, I'm showing the harmful algal blooms followed by the aragonate levels on the left. On the map, I have the harmful algal blooms and chlorophyll A la layer showing. Um, I'm also bringing up the water temperature example. So it's water temperature and salinity. And you can see that when I hovered over a portion of the graph that um, for the salinity at depth, I can find out the exact reading at that particular depth. Um, and then I also have a historical tropical wind cyclone exposure. Um, I've hovered over one of the histogram bars to show the precise information for that bar. And this is really just doing it just for your area of interest. So if you were to move your polygon around, um, then it would give you different results. And finally, we have six infographics available in our economics and commerce chapter, which I've already listed. Um, so I'm showing on the left the marine dependent jobs by state and the marine GDP by state. So three of the six infographics in this section come from the National Ocean Watch's email data. Okay. So at the bottom right of the tool, there are special tools available. And this allows you to get um, a little bit more coordinated with your viewing and analysis of the data. So I've already mentioned the coordinate entry. Um, that's that little keyboards just under the globe part of the tools. Um, you can also click on the one below that, which looks like a little map plan. Uh, and that's to return to your original location on the map. Some of us get really curious and start scrolling around and then we can't find where we were, especially if you drew a tiny little polygon. So this is how you get back to that. Um, you can measure distances in kilometers, nautical miles, and regular miles. You can change your base maps. And you can also include it on top of those or below the base map or on top. Um, you can put the RNC layers, the astronautical charts, or you can put the uh, US EEZ line so you can see when you start getting out of US waters. Then you have the ability to share your results with whomever you like. And there are a couple different ways you can do that. Um, up in the upper middle part of the tool, you have the little, what we call little hamburger, which is where the arrow is pointing. So it's like, the two buns in the middle. Um, and then if you click on that, you'll get the about, print, share, and metadata slash downloads. So if you want to print a PDF version of your tool, you can click on print and then choose PDF and you can design it however you want as far as page size and all. You can share your report with others by just basically sharing a um, small URL link or save it for later. And if you want to download the data or really investigate it further, we have that ability. We have the metadata and downloads for all the data in here. And what I like to do is this is how I test what we're doing a lot of times is um, bring up the marine cadaster in one screen and have the ocean reports on another so that I can 
dig even deeper using the ID tool and the data to actually read through the attributes and things like that to make sure that what I'm seeing in the ocean reports is jiving with what I'm seeing in marine cadaster or just to get more information. So a little bit more about printing your report. Um, it gives you some really interesting options. You can actually print the whole report or you can just print the infographics that you like. So it allows you to um, either choose the infographics individually or we have an industry section, which I'm not really sure how many people are using. I'm not sure how long we'll keep that. But right now we did talk to some subject matter experts in oil and gas, renewables, sand and minerals, and aquaculture and ask them which of the infographics are most um, useful for their industries. And so you could click, for instance, on aquaculture and it would only turn on those infographics and then you could go back and turn off or on any of the ones that you really still wanted or didn't want in there. And then as you're doing that down at the bottom, it tells you how many infographics it's keeping in there. See where it says 68 infographics. Okay, so that's basically it for um, my presentation. Uh, if you are using the tool or plan to use the tool, it would be great if you could let me know personally. You're welcome to email me directly or even call me or get in touch with our folks at info at marinecadaster.gov and I'll see that as well or anybody else on the team. Um, and then again, here's our URL for how to get to it. And I'm actually going to um, see if I can jump to the app real quick. Sorry about. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. That's crazy. I had it all set up and it backfired on me. Okay. Sarah, can you see the screen still? Uh, yeah, we see the ocean report screen. Yep. Okay, good. So I tried drawing a custom area using my iPad and it will work, but I can only really get it to work like the third try. So I'm just going to go to quick reports. So just imagine that you drew something um, and I'm going to um, zoom in and pick, you know, for no apparent reason, pick the Florida Keys. So you can see that it created this pretty quickly. Now these are kind of pre-canned, but oh, what the heck, I'll try and draw something. Let's go somewhere. Okay, do it with my finger, I guess. Why is it doing that? Okay, typical, I'm in a new present, or I'm in a presentation that's live and it won't do it for me. Anyway, normally I could just go in here and draw, but it doesn't like me doing it on the iPad today. Um, try again. Okay. See, it doesn't like it. But... I have to be very aggressive, apparently. Well, we get a feel for what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it, I was just trying to show how quickly it would come up with something if I were to draw it. Okay. Okay, there we go. Very strange polygon, but it did it. And it's slower than I expected. Probably because of what I did. There we go. Well, that's not too bad, considering I overlapped itself twice. Um, 
So it's still actually running a little bit like the depth and elevation and some other things. <laughs> I didn't like it, okay. Okay, so that, that went pretty fast. So you can see all of this is interactive. You can hover on things. You can turn on layers. Expand things. Link to other things. So that was just my little, my quick overview of how it works. So that's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Christine. You're uh, welcome. Great. Um, so we have a lot of great questions. And just to repeat to everyone, you can send in questions by typing them in to either the chat or the Q&A. Uh, so we, we actually have a ton of great questions already. Uh, so let's see. Starting here. Um, for someone who knows little about GIS, how is this tool different from the Marco and Northeast Ocean data portals? And is there overlap in data sets? Well, first, the Marco and the um, Northeast Ocean Data Portals are closer to, um, as far as the way that they work, to the Marine Cadaster project that is the parent project to this, where you can open up data sets, view them, investigate them. Um, they have some time sliders and things like that on theirs that we don't have. Um, but this is not giving you the ability to um, pick and choose data layers that you want to investigate further. It's just doing um, canned analysis of the data. So, you know, which their data sets aren't doing on the fly. So basically you can pick an area and just get the data for that area here. And it's just doing analysis based on what we've determined the analysis should be. Okay. All right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, mm -hmm. And Winfrey, if you had any follow-up to that, go ahead and, and send that in and I'll try and keep an eye out for it. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, that wasn't, that was, uh, no, that was Matt. All right. Um, let's see. Can you speak to the frequency of data updates for the tools? For instance, what year of email data is updated and when will it be next updated? I'm not sure the email, email data, um, but it should say it in there. I think it's 2016. Daniel, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, uh, I just encourage you, whoever's asking, do check the metadata just to be to be sure. I wouldn't want to lead you astray. Uh, but can you speak about data updates just in general about how how that works? I would say that depends on the data set. So. We are trying right now to, you know, some of the data sets on Marine Cadastro are updated like daily through the services and things like that, but we haven't been able to do that on Ocean Reports because of the way that it's structured. Um, but we are starting to um, work on ETLs to do that so that we can update some of the background information frequently. Um, we are putting, we're starting to put caveats in to tell people a little bit about that but it really does depend on the data set some things don't need to be updated you know monthly or every six months or something whereas other things really need to be updated monthly so we're trying to work through that but right now some of the you know i'm not really sure when the last time we updated was i think it's been about six months okay and there was a related question um you started to address some of the aspects but um it was, how was the process of collecting data, as I could see there are, is, are different types of information from different areas? I can imagine you have to contact different entities for obtaining it. Uh, are you working closely with those entities? Um, what would be the frequency of updating data? I think it is a great tool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so 
it really, again, depends on the data set. I mean, some data sets are national, but yes, we have to often um, talk to different regional groups within the federal government or in the states, or, you know, for instance, we have aquaculture data that we've pulled together from different states. Um, and we try and keep up with that, but we're never going to be, you know, absolutely up to date on, you know, every single state together, I don't think. And we're, it's a constant sort of herding of cats um, to get all the data together. So we're doing our best. Again, all that's in the metadata, who we got it from, when we pulled it in, that kind of thing. Um, another example, like aquaculture, are artificial reefs. Um, and we have, well, we are thinking about putting seagrass data in there, but that's not in there yet. So yeah, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of work goes into it. But the good thing is, is that we've been doing that for a long time for a lot of these data sets anyway, because we've been working on marine cadaster for almost 12 years. So, you know, as we added more and more data sets into marine cadaster, um, they tended to get more and more complex and we have to work with more and more people. And that's why I said at the very beginning, there are a lot of people that have touched these tools. Thank you, Christine. Um, sure. And Another sort of uh, related question, um, there's an effort underway in Chile to build a similar tool um, and they're interested in knowing how long it took to develop uh, ocean reports. Well, then, I would say the first the time scope or the second work. time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, they're also interested in this. Yes, we will hear that. But uh, the scope of the work in terms of how many people were involved um, and like full time sort of part time, that sort of thing. I'm gonna to have to figure that one out myself, um, but I can give you a guess on it. Maybe Daniel or Mark can follow up on it. Um, the tool, we started developing it probably four, four and a half years ago, and we started out with a different method. We were going with like all ESRI-based tools and we had a contractor. And we had the basis of what we wanted and all these infographics kind of set up within about a year in that. Um, but then it wasn't really working as fast as we wanted it to. So NOAA decided that they could try and develop it in-house. And once they started doing that, we spent probably another year or so getting the, you know, getting it all together in different code form. Um, and so then that's when we got it to work really, really fast. Um, and I would say since we've had it with NOAA, They've probably got about five different developers that work have worked on it some of the time. And then we've got, I don't know, probably around 10 people uh, that are working on data and um, reviewing and just overall project management, um, you know, outreach, that sort of thing. And it's all a lot of the same people, except for the developers, it's a lot of the same people that work on MarineCadastro.com too. Okay, thank you, Christine. Mark or Daniel, do you have any update on that? Your your numbers sound good, Christine, and your, your time frame sounds uh, like what I recall. This is Mark. Um, <laughs> uh, the other point in terms of the folks in Chile that might try to replicate this, um, an important thing to keep in mind is that the data that is behind this tool and basically giving you these results is locally hosted at NOAA's uh, Office for Coastal Management. And we did that because we just needed the performance that local hosting would provide. Uh, ideally, we'd love to be able to point directly to external services for this with the expectation they would be updated maybe more frequently than, than we can do on our team. But to get the performance that that we prefer, it really does require us to, to house that data in-house. Very good point. Thanks, Mark. Hello? Hi, Christine. Oh, okay. Hey, yeah. um, I think my internet is a little unreliable now. Nick, if you could sort of uh, be on standby in case that happens again. Sure thing. Um, okay. And let's see, there was a question. Will the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management rely on this data for its NEPA work? Um, no, it's not going to rely on this data for its NEPA work. It may use it for part of the NEPA work it does. 
Um, we are actually trying to get the word out internally too about this tool and work with um, our NEPA folks to determine if there are other data layers that would be advantageous to add to the tool. But since we have people in the Gulf of Mexico and headquarters in the Pacific and Alaska, um, it's sometimes a little difficult to get people to um, use something new. But um, we are trying to get the word out. And I know that there are a number of BOEM folks on the, on the call today too. Um, in terms of getting the word out, there was also a question. Um, how would one best keep abreast of changes in future plans for the tool? Uh, is there a, a, a marine cadastro list that you can subscribe to? Yes, absolutely, there is. Um, if you go to the Marine Cadaster website, um, there's a section where you can sign up for our newsletter. And okay. that'll let you know when we're updating data sets and things like that and tools for both all of our tools. Okay, great. And can you actually pull up your last uh, PowerPoint slide, Christine? And then I'll have some of the contact information. One second. My iPad went out for a second. All right, it's not essential if it's... Why is it nothing works when I need it to? <laughs> Murphy's Law. Do you still have me? Yeah, yeah. There? Yep, we still have it. Uh, okay, there you go. Okay, and then I think you'll need to share share screen. Oh. I wasn't on the Zoom. Um. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, great. Thank you. Okay. Right. And another question. Oh, what is planned for the next 12 to 18 months, such as in terms of adding data and other aspects? <laughs> um, we we are sort of dependent on NOAA's, um, their developers time, but we have a whole list of things that we want to update and change. And I don't have that list in front of me, to be honest with you, but um, if anybody wants to contact me about that, I can try and throw together what our plans are. Daniel is our data manager, so maybe he's, he might remember exactly what we have coming around the bend. I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, Daniel, but you're here. Sure. Yeah. I, there's four or five data sets that are sort of high frequency. Uh, uh, they change at a high frequency. So we're going to be uh, at, you know, putting in a mechanism to uh, get those updated as fast as they change. And then there's a, a handful of other data sets that, um, that uh, have been updated from the uh, sort of other side of the Marine Cadaster National Viewer effort uh, that we're going to um, bring back in. Uh, but I think on the application side, on the design side, there's um, you know, a, a lot of um, a lot of small, uh, you know, adjustments, repairs, updates, fixes. Uh, no, no major structural changes or no no major functional changes. We're going to try to try to stabilize it here for a little while. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, a specific question, under natural resources, you only have managed highly migratory species. What about ground fisheries, lobster, sand dab, sardines, crab, halibut, et cetera? Mark, do you have any background on that one? Well, just, it may be not specific to the highly migratory species, but in terms of fisheries data, uh, we've been really careful to include information in this tool which is useful for sort of a screening process and and sort of thinking about what fisheries data is appropriate to that screening level assessment uh, we've been given really strong feedback from our fisheries colleagues that this in no way is intended to uh, supplant the typical um, consultation process and so we really see our role with regard to fisheries data as just getting you started and then directing you to the appropriate fisheries offices and expertises for this, you know, the really detailed consultation decisions that you're going to need to make. Okay, 
Great, thank you. Um, there's uh, several questions related to whether uh, people can import their own layers or whether you're interested in, in, in users submitting additional data. Right now, you can't import your own layer in uh, Ocean Reports, and I'm not sure if we'll ever get to that point. Um, we may eventually, I don't want to promise anybody anything, but you know, people have asked whether or not they can bring their own polygon into it. So that's something we've thought about, but bring your own layers in. Um, I don't see that on the horizon right now. And I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oh, uh, just generally whether people can import their own, own data or, or add layers. Yep. Yeah, not not at present, um, you know, but oh, but if they if they have data layers that they think are important that we don't have in the tool again contact us and um, we might consider it. I don't, the other part of your question, I think, had to do with um, getting your layers into ocean reports like, for instance, you know, letting us know you have a data layer and um, trying to make it available in the ocean reports through us. And that would have to meet the same rules that we have for marine cadaster, which is um, that it's either uh, what we consider to be authoritative, which is kind of a hard thing to explain sometimes, but um, it really just means that usually the state or federal government is using that data or has created that data for decision making or if it's the best available. And again, it um, is the data layer that uh, everybody in that um, industry is already using. So um, if, you, if it's being adopted by the state or federal agencies, usually we might consider it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there are several questions as to whether this extends to US territories or, and are there any data, uh, are there data that are available for any uh, international areas? The uh, U.S. areas only. So it, the, we have the U.S. territorial areas in the tool, but um, nothing outside of U.S. waters. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. It says, can you look at critical habitat areas from individually listed species, different layers, or just all the critical habitat in an area? All the critical habitat in the area but you could like i said um, turn on marine cadaster turn on the same layer and use the id tool to see all the different um, polygons for each one okay thank you um are the the our lists of deep sea sponges and coral species among the information that can be found on ocean reports are they mark do you want to hit that one if it isn't in the tool itself, uh, those data sets are also in the cadaster and they are listed in there. I know they're in the report. I just don't remember how it reports it, to be honest with you. I think it does give you the list um, for the area that you've drawn, but it won't give you everywhere. Okay. Okay. Um, question, let's see, are the federal statutes and um, congressional acts listed under each report? Yes. Okay, yeah, relevant ones are. Okay. And um, can the public this is, use and rely on this data in its own reports? Can the public use and I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I think they're asking like sort of how official is this? You, you can say you use this and it came from a US government source. It is one of many sources that you can use, I would say. I wouldn't say to depend on ocean reports as your only source of information, um, but I would say that the data that you have in there or that we have in there um, is pretty up to date. And, you know, again, read the metadata, buyer beware, but we are just trying to make a lot of data available in one place so that people can get sort of that, um, 50,000 foot idea of what's going on in an area. Okay, thank you. Uh, question, what is the export file type? Oh, well, they're zip files for the most part. Um, and then within those zip files, um, 
I think if we're talking about the data downloads, I'm not sure, but um, if we're talking about the data downloads, then we've zipped up the data from the source in many cases. And so it might be a geodatabase geo or shape files or a CSV file. If we're talking about the report itself, then you know you can output to a PDF or just print it directly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so there's a question, are these analyses done on the fly from the source or aggregated to specific geographies and then queried for, for the user's specified area? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand that one either. Um, Daniel, do you understand that question? Yeah, I think I got it. Um, we basically bring in all of the sort of all the source data um, periodically. You know, it, at this point, it's been sort of on the six months to twelve months frequency. We bring it in. It all gets stored in the back end in a post GIS um, database, and then the polygon that the user draw the uh, user will draw a polygon, and that analysis, you know, that sort of clip cut and analysis is done you know, live when you hit, you know, go. Uh, so there's no other aggregation. It's, it's you know, we're bringing in the data uh, right from the source as original as possible. You know, sometimes we, you know, we're able to trim it down and take out, you know, you know sort of irrelevant pieces to it that, that aren't included in the report itself. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, is there anything about microplastic pollution? I, no, not at present. Okay, and then another question. Um, I'm not sure if it came in after you discussed it or not. Do you plan to add a mechanism? Oh, no, no, I get it. Okay. Do you plan to add a mechanism for contributions from regional sources, not remote services, but actual data from regions contribute and transformed into a format that Ocean Reports can host? Well, I feel like we do that when we're talking to the region. So if they have data sets that are, you know, we, we probably wouldn't put data in just for, you know, say data offshore of one state or two states, unless it's California or something, a large state. We, we tend to focus on data that we can use that covers, you know, whole regions or the whole US EEZ if possible. But um, to do that, like I mentioned before, we have to talk to um, a lot of the sources and try and um, aggregate data together into something that looks the same, feels the same, um, has a similar legend, that sort of thing. So you're not looking at 15 different versions of, um, you know, aquaculture data, for instance. So. We are already trying to do that. Um, I don't see at present the ability to bring in automatically data from all the regions and tie that together through some model. But um, yeah, I kind of feel like we, we do that to some extent already. Okay, thank you, Christine. Um, let's see. As a specific question, I just made a custom map. When I go to print, the image of the map is distorted. That is, the aspect ratio is not preserved. It remains distorted when I print it. Is this a problem on my end, or is this a, a, a general thing that happens? Uh, I haven't had it happen, but um, I'm not sure. That's one of those things where if you talk to us directly and send us some screen captures, we can maybe try and figure it out. Often it is the settings on the user side that can change those things. So I would, I don't know if anybody else has something to say about that. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of trying to using, uh, use a different browser. Okay. Uh, try All doing right. Chrome, Chrome, I would suggest. Always a good suggestion. Okay, great. Uh, we're sort of in the last few questions. So um, we sort of put you through the ringer, guys. Let's see. Um, there's a question, what about using crowdsourcing to update the data, meaning implementing modules that would allow citizens to follow step-by-step -step procedures to update the databases already used in Ocean Reports? And uh, that was followed by, thank you for this wonderful work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any crowdsourced data like that for some of the data sets that we have. Um, 
how, well, actually, if you think about AIS, it's technically crowdsourcing ship traffic, but um, in a way. But again, we you know we're dealing with authoritative data. So before we would be able to do something like that, it would have to be vetted and um, you know approved by whatever agency or agencies would typically make that data available or use that data for its decision making. So and that's kind of a little bit outside our role and probably outside our budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, and just to let um, somebody had asked earlier about the ENAL data, and it is from 20, it was most recent, it's 2015 data, just to let you okay. know. Okay. I think we're going to be updating that fairly soon. Okay, great. Uh, last question, quick one. Does your platform link to OBIS? Um, no, it does not. Okay, great. Uh, great, isn't you're responding. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so well, that is our, the last question we're gonna uh, take today. Uh, we have a lot of people who've written in. Thank you, you for sharing this and, and for all your work on the, the platform. Uh, it's much appreciated. And I think you're definitely gonna have some folks contacting you, um, including no problem. Um, some folks from other countries who are, are working on similar systems and would love to learn from your experiences. So uh, thank you, uh, Christine. And Daniel and Mark, we really appreciate you being here to talk about this. And thank you to everyone who's able to make it uh, to today's webinar. Uh, we hope you can uh, join us for future webinars. And thank you again, Christine and Daniel. Thanks, Sarah and, Mark. and Nick, for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Okay. We hope everyone has a, a great rest of their day. Bye, everyone. Bye.